Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of History Quest. I'm your host Brian from the McLeod County Historical Society and uh, this month I've got a few stories for you as well as another installment of The Undeniable Truth and then we're going to cap the show off with a little bit of museum news. So uh, sit back, stay tuned and we'll see you in a bit. So our first story today is about the Red River Oxcart Trails. A portion of the trail actually did run through McLeod County, and I found a little bit of information on that, wrote a little story, and now I'd like to share it with you. So here we go. It was the 19th century in what would become Minnesota. The region was part of the frontier, an unbounded wilderness of wooded savanna, conifer forests, and tall grass prairies. For those traveling through the region, Overland paths provided the only means of transportation. They were rough going, maneuvering through marshy lowland, thick tangles of willow brush, and woods that were nearly impenetrable. Few of these roads existed, yet those that did were well known by travelers trekking through the wilderness to government outposts, Indian villages, and white settlements. The most well known were the Red River Ox Cart Trails, the main travel routes through the region, which were often graced with two-wheeled ox carts, Indian ponies, and dog teams. The trails were primarily used to haul fur from St. Paul to Pemina, but other travelers used them as well. Contrary to popular belief, the trails were not part of any permanent pathway that was carved through the land, but rather a set of smaller pathways that ran like veins through the heartland of the North Country. One of the smaller trails that was part of the Red River Trail was the Henderson to Pemina Trail. The trail led from Fort Hill and Henderson in a northwesterly direction, skirted the edge of the big woods by Lake Addy and Lake Marion in McLeod County, then ran along the edge of the northern forest before heading across the open plains to Pemina along the North Dakota-Canada border. The trail was not without obstacle or danger. In the summer months, it was dangerous to stray from the path, Dense foliage in the wooded areas, as well as thick, tall, growing prairie grass made it difficult to keep one's bearings if they were not familiar with the surrounding countryside. In addition, during the first half of the 19th century, the trail led through the heart of Dakota land where, according to the source, instances between travelers and Dakota sometimes resulted in quarrels. For this reason, travelers on the trail typically traveled in large bands and at times with a military escort. At night, when they set up camp, the carts were often drawn into a circle with the camp in the center. Conditions on the route were not always favorable. Winter meant the trail would be drifted over. In places, it could be easily lost from view. In spring, the trail was often muddy, and in summer, they were dusty. Though conditions were not always satisfactory, the sights and the sounds must have been something to marvel at. In the early years, Herds of buffalo could often be seen grazing in the distance, and the sounds of insects on the tall grass prairie must have been serene in its own way. The Red River trails were considered the highways of the time, but by the 1860s their use was beginning to decline. Railroads were being built in the state, as well as several government roads that were built through the countryside, some of which were built on top of or beside the old trails. Today, remnants of the old Red River trails are nearly non-existent, Though some of our back roads and even major highways travel through the same corridors, there are no real traces of the old trails left. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, this next one is a story about a trapper who lived in McLeod County named John Borden. He was kind of one of the, the last trappers in the area. And uh, again, I came across it in the archives down at the, uh, at the museum, and I was just enthralled by it. And so I thought I'd share it with you. So here we go. It was a different time in McLeod County, almost an entirely different world. It was the late 1860s, the Civil War was over, and there was an influx of immigration into central Minnesota. Most who came to Minnesota had the intention to farm. Their dream was a house, a good crop, and to raise a family in peace. Others, however, came for adventure, and though the region may not have been as wild as it was prior to the Civil War, those seeking a life of adventure could easily find it. One such man was named John Borden. John was originally from Indiana, but came north to trap. He'd lived in the McLeod County region on and off for several years and was well acquainted with the land, and in 1866, he located here permanently. While others looked to farm, John lived the life of a fur trapper. 
He spent his days running trap lines, hunting for fur-bearing animals, and doing his best to survive in the wild countryside. In the 1860s, though it could seem scarce at times, wildlife abounded by today's comparisons. The land was dotted with water holes and lowland cattails that were filled with waterfowl. On the prairies were the prairie chickens that nested in the tall grasses, and in the woods were white-tailed deer and the occasional bear. In the early days, hunters would even come across a bison on occasion. Hunting was a good way to survive, but it was trapping where men like Borden found money. Trapping had been a way to achieve wealth for decades, but by the 1860s, the market bottomed out and fur held little value. That didn't stop Borden, however, as he looked to the land and fur as a means of wealth. He spent a great deal of his time trapping along the border of McLeod and Renville County. He caught mink, otter, beaver, skunks, and muskrats. He was willing to travel long distances, and at one time covered a trap line that ran for 20 miles. The main animal being trapped in the region was the muskrat, and in 1866, Borden harvested 1,600 of them. The hides were worth 13 cents apiece, and that year, needed to be hauled into St. Paul to receive payment. Though men like Borden enjoyed their life in the wilderness, they still yearned for some comfort. At some point, Borden decided it was time to build a cabin. He took lumber from an old house in Plato and used it to build a small shack. It was small, but a popular place for others like Borden to stop and rest. According to stories, on one night the cabin slept 18 people. The era of the 19th century survivalist in central Minnesota was short-lived. Several trappers worked the countryside in the early part of the century, but by the late 1850s, the prices of fur plummeted. Men like Borden worked the trap lines for a few more years after that, but the world around them was changing fast. By the 1870s and 1880s, railroads began coming into the region and the wilder areas were shrinking. By the turn of the century, the landscape that the fur trappers lived on was all but gone. It was a quiet end to a way of life lived by countless men of the time. In a world of fake news, where the facts are sometimes altered, we bring you the undeniable truth with Brian Haynes. Hello, America. Welcome to another segment of The Undeniable Truth. Here we are at the end of 2020, a year that, uh, to say the least, has been troublesome, not just for the United States, but for the entire world. Um, COVID-19 came about and uh, just, it just turned us all up on our heads. And then we, had the, uh, then we had that election, if that's what you want to call it. Um, I'm not talking about any kind of, you know, voter fraud or anything like that. It just, I've seen elections in the past. This isn't the first one I've, I've voted. You know, I, I love to vote. It's a, it's a right as an American to vote, and I love having that right. But I've got to say, uh, this last election, the media, the candidates, just made a mockery of the whole system. And for the first time in my life, I, I got to say, I, I, I question the future of our country or our nation. Where's our integrity? What happened to us? But I guess that's not for me to, to decide, uh, just, just to ponder. I'm just a mere commentator. commentator, commentator. I'm just a commentator. <clears throat> well, at any rate, uh, we've got some stories for you again. Well, they're not really stories. They're, uh, they're, they're truths, undeniable truths, truths you can't um, dispute, you know, stuff that's actually happened. Because, you know, as we say in the introduction, history is sometimes the only thing that holds any truth. A person you, you may have heard of in history is uh, Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, the famous conqueror, Napoleon, um, you know, he was the dictator of France, or emperor, excuse me, of France, and tried to take over Europe. Unsuccessful in doing it, of course. His, his downfall was when he tried to invade Russia. And as Adolf Hitler would realize so many years later, and as Napoleon Bonaparte realized first, never, ever, ever invade Russia in wintertime. And uh, also don't challenge any of them to a vodka drinking contest. You probably lose. At any rate, <clears throat> um, 
the emperor at one time, you know, he had a, he had a lot of troops, and uh, Napoleon was a leader who who always wanted his troops to be, you know, happy. Um, he wanted his troops to fight for him, not just for France, but for him. For you know, he's their cause, and uh, so so he would do things to up their morale. Well, at one time, um, his chief of staff was ordered to round up. 3,000 rabbits for his men to hunt. Um, so he did that. Uh, the rabbits, well, they were released from their cages when the hunt was ready to go, or at least that was the plan. Um, instead of scattering and instead of the men hunting down the rabbits, the rabbits turned and charged toward Bonaparte and his men in a uh, vicious and unstoppable onslaught uh, it, you know, we're, we're taught that the Waterloo was the conqueror's greatest defeat, but uh, clearly it was the attack of the killer bunnies that, you know, really did Napoleon in. So there's some undeniable truth for you right there. You've probably heard of Captain Morgan, the famous rum. It's a well-loved brand. A lot of people drink it. Uh, what not everybody knows, though, is that Captain Morgan was a real guy. True, totally true-to-life real person. Uh, he was a Welsh privateer. Uh, for all you who don't um, know, privateer is a kind of a more correct word of saying pirate, or uh, maybe I should say it is the more um, correct term for saying legal pirate, one that's sanctioned by a, a nation or a state. Um, at any rate, Captain Morgan was a Welsh privateer. Uh, he fought alongside the English against the Spanish in the Caribbean um, in the 1660s and 1670s. His first name was Henry. He was knighted by King Charles of England. Uh, his exact birth date is unknown, but uh, it was sometime probably around 1635. Uh, in eight, excuse me, in 1688, he died in Jamaica, and apparently he was very rich, uh, likely from his career as little more than just a pirate. Uh, but uh, remember that now, next time you, you have a drink of Captain Morgan or a Captain Coke or a Captain Diet Coke or wh whatever it's going to be, um, that you are toasting a, a real-to-life pirate. Me? I'm more of a beer guy myself. You've probably heard of the Black Death. The plague that swept through Europe and Asia in the, uh, in the, in the, in the Middle Ages. Um, killed countless people. If we think COVID is bad, this was way worse. Um, people were, they, they didn't know what was causing it. They, you know, people in the Middle Ages didn't quite have a grasp on science that we have today. And so they came up with all kinds of crazy reasons as to why this plague was, was so widespread. Um, modern historians have a theory, though, that the the plague came from fleas, biting fleas that traveled on the back of rats. And these fleas would bite humans and give them the plague. Well, um, there may be a, uh, a cause for this, why there were so many rats. Um, you know, not, not the sole cause, but definitely a, uh, a, a contributing factor to, to the rat problem in Europe. And this goes back to the 13th century a man called Pope Gregory IV declared a war on cats, cats of all things, declared a war on cats. He felt that cats were the instrument of Satan. Don't ask me why. But at any rate, uh, because of this belief, he ordered that all cats in Europe be exterminated to rid them of Satan, or to rid them of the instruments of Satan, as um, apparently these cats were. Well, at any rate... Uh, his plan backfired because the, uh, with, with so few cats in Europe, the population of rats exploded. I, I mean, just went crazy. And um, this is at a time where these rats were carrying fleas, the biting fleas, that were, that were giving people the plague. So we can look back on Pope Gregory IV and his war on cats and say, well, maybe that's why the plague was so bad in Europe at that time. So on our last segment, we did a little piece about George Washington, the nation's first president, mostly about the dollar bill and how George Washington, though he's on the first dollar bill, or the dollar bill, he wasn't the first person on the dollar bill. 
Well, my team found a little bit more information on George Washington. There is an old saying, uh, maybe it's more of a little bit of an old wives' tale or a myth, but uh, that George Washington could not tell a lie. Well, you know, he may be dear to our hearts being our nation's first president, but let me tell you something, America. The fact that George Washington could not tell a lie is a lie in itself. Um, you know, I think the world of George Washington, uh, you know, as a historian, I've learned that the, uh, the best leaders or the, the hardest, I should, maybe I shouldn't say the best leaders, but the, the biggest challenge for any leader is a leader who steps in right after a revolution because you have all these different factions of the population who are wanting different things. They all fought this revolution uh, mainly under one cause, but they all have different ideas of what they want. And if the leader who's out there isn't satisfying all of these demands, well, you have the chance for another revolution or a civil war within this new nation. Well, George Washington, of course, um, was the first leader of the United States you know, after the revolution. And uh, he was tasked with that as well, with different factions or states in, in this sense, you know, the, the former colonies who were, were all looking for something different. Um, so he has my utmost respect. However, by no way can we say that that man never lied. Um, the myth is that, of course, he did. And that uh, also, when he was a boy, he cut down his father's apple tree with a hatchet. When his father confronted him, he said, I cannot tell a lie. Yes, but that never happened. That is just another myth. It first appeared in the autobiography of Washington, where the writer later admitted he was just trying to display the president's virtuous nature. So the whole I cannot tell a lie thing never happened. Just another myth. Pushed on the American people to make us believe something that's not true. Something that happens so way too often in our modern society. Well, at least you have me, my team, and this network to bring you the undeniable truth. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the stories and the little segment that we did there. Uh, it's kind of goofy, but you know, I'm not everything has to be serious, uh, so those who know me probably know that well. Um, at any rate, uh, just to share a few things about the museum, um, unfortunately right now because of the latest government order, we are closed until December 21st um, just to, to help stop the spread of COVID, of course. Um, we are still taking online you know, requests, so if you have any kind of um, you know, family history you want to dig up or anything, feel free to call and we'll, we'll see what we can do for you. In other news, of course, uh, you may already realize we won't be having our, uh, our gala this year. We had it last year, very successful, had a lot of fun, a lot of good people came. Um, even some HCVN people were there. Uh, so uh, at any rate, though, we won't be having that this year because of the COVID restrictions and everything. So uh, we'll, we're planning for 2021. So, um, Also, uh, just, uh, just to let you know that um, our annual meeting, uh, the board actually voted to do it by mail this year. So if you're a member, you should be receiving a ballot in the mail uh, with a little a real condensed financial report to go in. Not ideal, not how we wanted to do it. Uh, we were originally thinking you know we could wait until October and things would settle down enough to have an annual meeting well that wasn't really the case and then we thought well let's wait until December and then we'll kind of do a hybrid we can you know have like maybe a minimum of 15 people show up or something at the museum and then do a zoom meeting and of course that <clears throat> um, didn't pan out over the latest restrictions so um, some other museums in the state have actually their boards have okayed uh, doing a ballot by mail just this one time and we thought you know maybe that's the best thing because um, we've got you know with board members and staff all in the one room uh, we're already over that 10 person minimum that was set out by the guidelines so we will just be doing a, a, a mail-in ballot this year um, so I apologize for the inconvenience for that but uh, our hands were really tied in that situation um, the other big news is uh, we're putting a barn in the addition if you didn't already know that it is a uh, 20 foot by 12 foot actual timber framed barn that we built inside the building and it's I mean, staying inside the building and then it has a little uh, 10 by 12 lean-to on it which is a little blacksmith shop and then it's a, it's a barn so that's kind of exciting we've got some volunteers working on that uh, little 
little hiccup uh, in the process right now because of the COVID restrictions, so they're not down there working. But uh, as soon as this is over, they'll be they'll be back at it 100%. Um, so hopefully we'll have that up, you know, right around the end of the year. Um, other than that, uh, we're just you know, 2020 has definitely been a tough year. Um, where it's the end is in sight. I mean, the light at the end of the tunnel is basking on us right now. So, uh, so the end is in sight and we're really hoping for a better 2021. Um, hopefully we can get things back to normal and start holding some events and fundraisers and all that good stuff again. So um, at any rate, thanks for watching and uh, we will see you next year.